the 1947 Roswell incident may be the most famous UFO crash story of all time. But was it the first? On April 17, 1897, a mysterious airship was seen in the skies over the small Fort Worth suburb of Aurora, Texas, on a collision course with the home of a local judge. The story of the Aurora crash is fairly simple and straightforward. Uh, according to the newspaper accounts at the time, uh, early in the morning of April 17, 1897, a large silver cigar-shaped object came fluttering closer and closer to the earth, uh, struck a tower at uh, Judge Proctor's house, exploded, scattering debris all over the place. Two days later, April 19, 1897, the Dallas Morning News reported. About 6 o'clock this morning, the early risers of Aurora were astonished at the sudden appearance of the airship which has been sailing through the country. It was traveling due north and much nearer the earth than ever before. It sailed directly over the public square and when it reached the north part of town, collided with the tower of Judge Proctor's windmill and went into pieces with a terrific explosion. scattering debris over several acres of ground, wrecking the windmill and water tank, and destroying the judge's flower garden. According to the local legend, many of Aurora's residents raced to Judge J.S. Proctor's farm to help in any way they could. What they found was beyond comprehension. The Dallas Morning News reported that someone or something was in the craft. The pilot of the ship is supposed to have been the only one on board, and while his remains were badly disfigured, enough of the original has been picked up to show that he was not an inhabitant of this world. Mr. T.J. Weems, the United States Army Signal Services officer at this place, and an authority on astronomy, gives it as his opinion that the pilot was a native of the planet Mars. His description was that it was an alien in form and he was referred to as a Martian. Now the only reference to Martians at that time were in the drawings of the science fiction writers, so it could have been sparked in part by literature. Of course I wasn't there, so I can't say for sure who piloted the craft. All I can go is by the newspaper accounts, and they made it quite clear that uh, the remains clearly indicated he was not an inhabitant of this world. According to the Fort Worth Register, the alien did not survive. They reported that he was given a Christian burial in the town cemetery. The fragments of the craft were then thrown down a well. The townspeople more or less wanted to forget about it. And I won't say pretend it didn't happen, but probably couldn't cope with what happened and didn't know. A small stone was placed over the unmarked plot to confirm the grave of the airship pilot. But as time passed, he would not be allowed to rest in peace. Years have gone by, leaving fewer and fewer eyewitnesses to the events of April 1897. Eventually, the story became a legend, a colorful tale that some considered to be fiction. Judge Proctor's land was sold. The newspapers stopped writing about the incident in Aurora, and the gravesite became little more than a curiosity. My initial reaction to the Aurora story, uh, I have to admit, was a little bit of one of skepticism. But if you're going to be a history writer, you need to at least make a stab at trying to find out the truth. And that's what launched my investigation. When I began to research it, however, I, I found that there was more to the story than just the Aurora incident. Uh, I, I went to the Dallas Morning News, assuming that the Aurora story would be a headline on page one. Well, it wasn't. It was buried in the middle of page five. And what intrigued me was it wasn't even the first airship story on that page. In fact, there were over a dozen different articles about the mysterious airships listed in the April 19th edition of the paper. There were at least 16 in that same area the two days before this incident. Uh, 16 reported cases by reputable people is significant. 
In late November 1896, thousands of witnesses reported seeing the mysterious airship 1,500 miles away over California. Over the next few months, the tale spread to more than 20 additional states from California to Michigan. In Texas alone, the airship was spotted in over 30 counties between April and May of 1897. For those two months in 1897, literally hundreds of Texans saw something in the night air over Texas. They described it as cigar-shaped. Some people said it had lights. Some people said it didn't. Uh, some said it could go 200, 150, 300 miles an hour. It could do things that airships today can barely do. Top speed at that time was about 35 to 40 miles an hour by train. And for reputable people to say something flew over their head going more than 100 miles an hour would be the same as us saying something went over our head going thousands of miles an hour. Texas historian Wallace Cheriton focused his research on the incident on the so-called witnesses listed in the newspaper articles. What I was trying to do was prove, were these real people? I was very pleased to find, yes, they were. They were, in fact, real people. When I first heard the stories of the airships, that excited me. It wasn't a lone incident. People across the country were experiencing something. That gave it uh, validity. What were they seeing? Why were they seeing it? I'm not sure that we'll ever know what they were seeing. What I am sure is they saw something. Could it have been a balloon? Perhaps. Probably not an airplane, since those didn't exist. The first recorded man-made heavier-than-air flight was made, of course, by the Wright brothers in December of 1903 at Kitty Hawk. So whatever was flying over Texas in 1897 was not man-made. In fact, while hot air balloons were commonly used in the late 1800s, they were not able to perform complicated maneuvers, such as right angle turns and rapid altitude changes that had been described by witnesses. Patents had been registered for more advanced airships, but there is no record of any actually flying during that period. We're talking about something that did not exist in 1897 and yet was seen by literally thousands of people. If there's a better example of a UFO, I don't know what it is. Soon after the Aurora crash was reported, the sightings ended. Suddenly, there were questions. Were these sightings real or were they all part of a gigantic hoax? If you subtract out the known hoaxes, if you forget about them, what you're left with are hundreds of sightings by just common everyday people that had absolutely no motive other than the fact I saw something and I want to report it. Over the years we investigate hundreds of thousands of UFO reports. They're seen, they land, and they fly away. This was something where it was seen, crashed, and left behind an occupant. That's why, to me, Aurora was the best airship case to investigate. And then, ah, it's before Roswell. No one's gone in to cover it up. They didn't know about it. So that, to me, was the ultimate case to get the evidence I needed to prove or disprove what was going on. Coming up, the investigation focuses on the alien on board. We sent a letter and asked permission to exhume the body. Aurora, Texas, 1897. Fifty years before Roswell, newspapers reported a major crash and a dead spaceman buried in the Aurora Cemetery. But as time went by, the story was lost. Then, 70 years later, it resurfaced. Well, in 1973, Bill Case started writing articles for the Dallas Morning News, and that spread over the countryside. The interest jumped because, again, somebody was resurrecting the old Aurora crash in 1897. The legend was reborn. 
Ufologists across the country scramble to uncover the truth behind the possible alien graveyard. Hayden Hughes, the founder of the International UFO Bureau, was among the first to arrive in Aurora. Aurora was the outstanding case to me because of the crash of one of the airships for study and for the remains of a pilot to be studied or exhumed if he was buried. Aurora was different. There was a body, a supposed alien body. There's very few retrievable corpses or bodies associated with UFOs, but none that can be documented as well as the Aurora case. My belief in what the occupant pilot was, what it was said, that it was the pilot of what the craft was, his description was that it was an alien in form. It was small in stature, which would confirm uh, the type of creatures that are seen most frequently aboard UFOs. They are small in stature, childlike in size. The body, the crash site, the remnants of the airship, to Hughes, these had to be either the real thing or a hoax, and it was worth investigating. As to what to expect when we came to Aurora that first time, I was quite surprised that it wasn't as big as I visualized it to be. Uh, coming into town, where was it? Uh, well, we just went through it. There's the cemetery, okay? There's the hill. Uh, the windmills over this way. Uh, there's a, some houses down this way or businesses. That was the extent of it. Another surprise. Hughes's reception by the residents of Aurora. It appeared that they had no interest in solving the mystery. One time you talk, the people were open. The next time, they were not. We were allowed in the cemetery on some occasions. On some occasions we were barred and could not go in the cemetery. So the emotional level of the town uh, kind of told me they wanted no involvement with it. I had gone from extreme excitement and the possibility of what we could get to a frustration in that it was like the town was against us from the beginning. Then Hughes and other UFO researchers in Aurora had a breakthrough. The discovery of first-hand accounts of the crash. The witnesses were less than perfect. Some memories had faded. Others were incomplete. And eyewitnesses were now in their 80s. Ufologist Jim Mars was among the first to interview the residents. In 1973, I interviewed three people who were alive at the time. One, Robbie Hansen. Uh, said it was a hoax, but then she, by her own story, she was not a direct witness, had no direct knowledge of it. Uh, her father was uh, told about it, he laughed, thought it was a hoax, and that stuck in her mind. But then, Mars discovered two witnesses who contradicted Hansen and offered first-hand accounts of the actual crash. There's Mary Evans, who did recall that something crashed her parents went to look at the wreckage, but would not let her go. So we have kind of an indirect witness there who says it did happen. And then we've got Charlie Stevens, who as a 10-year-old boy was out doing the chores and actually told me he saw the thing go over and said it was trailing smoke and it seemed to be in trouble. He saw it disappear towards Aurora, heard the explosion, saw smoke going up. He wanted to go up and see what had happened. But his father, this old farmer in 1897, said, no, son, we have to finish the chores. And he said his father went up into town the next day and came back and told him about all the wreckage that was lying around. So the preponderance of the eyewitness testimony leans towards something happened. In addition to eyewitness accounts, researchers located one man who added a new twist to the investigation. Aurora resident Raleigh Oates, who suffered from an extreme case of rheumatoid arthritis, believed his debilitating health condition was somehow connected to the Aurora legend. Raleigh Oates lived at the site of the crash. I believe he moved there in 1945. 
And when he moved there, he had the well cleaned out because it had all this metal stuff and debris down in it. And uh, he needed to use it for water. Oates believes that the water in that well that he and his family drank for about 12 years affected their health drastically. In fact, he developed some of the worst arthritis conditions in his hands and other things that anybody has seen. I don't see how a person could survive or could walk or, or could function in any way. And basically it was, uh, they would either swell up so big that they would burst. And uh, at times probably bigger than golf balls on your fingers. And he claimed that it was from maybe the water from the well that they used. That's the way he told it. Brawley Oates told me that, that it was because of radiation from the well where people had thrown pieces of this Aurora spaceship. But in sealing off the well on his property, Oates also sealed crucial evidence to the mystery inside. For researchers, the scientific evidence to support their case was becoming increasingly difficult to find. We can't go on legends. We need scientific proof that you could take any court of law and prove that this event actually took place as our investigation disclosed. In 1973, investigators set out to the crash site and the graveyard. They hoped to find any evidence that could have survived the 75 years since the crash. Coming up. Mysterious metal samples baffled the experts. It's just a marvelous thing to have a piece of something you believe really could have come from a spaceship. In the 1973 investigation, Researchers found witnesses that authenticated an airship crash in April 1897. There were also claims of an alien buried in the local cemetery. But even with personal testimonies, ufologists realized that they needed scientific evidence. They hoped to find debris from the crash on the property formerly owned by Judge J.S. Proctor. What happened to the metal is probably anyone's guess at this point. The best guess to me was the main bulk of it was hauled off, and what was left behind was thrown down the well. Finding the well was easy, but researchers quickly discovered a problem. The well had been sealed off years earlier by the new property owner, Brawley Oates. He had this big slab of eight by eight feet concrete over the old well, so to move that would be a, a major job. Discouraged, investigators turned their search for clues to other parts of the property. They went around and, and they, they got the little pinging of, of the machine and they dig down and they find pieces of stuff. And some of the things they found were natural things you would find on a piece of property that had been around for years and had been farmed. Nails, bolts, and many other identifiable items were dug up at the crash site. But then, something caught their attention. One of the fellows from Corpus Christi, Texas, I found a piece that was very significant that MUFON is actually had analyzed by John Schusler. This was tested two times. In 1973, immediately after it was taken out of the ground, it was transmitted to me, and I took it into an aerospace laboratory. This laboratory was one that was used to determine the failure modes of aircraft and spacecraft parts. So they had the latest and best equipment. Uh, they are the ones that did the first analysis and determined the unusual nature of it. The analysis showed it had been there for a long, long time. And then when you cut into the metal, they were 95% pure aluminum and 5% iron. 5% iron in solution in aluminum is, is a no-no. It doesn't mix that way. It's like less than a percent normally. And when there is iron, there is usually zinc or other materials. There was none of that in this case. Although the major aerospace laboratory that initially tested the sample has asked to remain anonymous for this program, Schusler verified the results with the NASTIS laboratories in Houston, Texas. 
According to Schussler, both laboratories reached the same conclusion. Intrigued, he had the laboratories continue their tests on the sample to further determine the object's origin. The stories were that this thing exploded, it blew molten material out of this vast explosion mess, and that material hit things and dried and cooled. Well, the structural analysis of the material showed that it was air-cooled on the ground after it had been molten in the air. So the structure was perfect to fit the story. Has Schussler uncovered the smoking gun to the Aurora crash? The material found and analyzed in 1973 couldn't have been made at that time on that farm or in the town of Aurora or anywhere around there, but it had to have been made in a very sophisticated laboratory using ultra-pure refining techniques. It's, it's just a marvelous thing to have a piece of something you believe really could have come from a spaceship. Newspapers were quick to jump on the story of the new investigations into the airship crash, and as a result, the accuracy of the reporting suffered. Such was the case with a different sample sent to Dr. Tom Gray, now a professor emeritus at Kansas State University. One day, uh, there was a knock at my door, and uh, a gentleman came in, and he had in his possession pieces that he had found at the reported site of the spaceship crash in 1897. Dr. Gray's colleague asked him to analyze the samples to determine if this was a piece of the Aurora spaceship. What you are looking at is the actual artifact that was tested. I showed this piece to my father-in-law a few days after I had done the analysis, and his first comment to me was, is where did you get that water pump impeller? And so uh, I, I kind of knew that that didn't come from a spaceship for sure. Once he determined the first sample's mundane origin, Dr. Gray began testing the two remaining metal strips. Once he discovered the pieces were primarily iron, he made an unusual finding. When I checked their magnetic properties, I did it by uh, basically putting them in the presence of another ma of a magnet, and they didn't interact with that magnet, and I thought, that, that's kind of interesting. Perplexed, Dr. Gray searched for a certified metallurgist to give a second opinion on his puzzling find. It turns out that iron-zinc alloys can be non-magnetic or magnetic, depending on how they're cooled. Then, Dr. Gray relayed his story, along with his conclusions, to his school newspaper. When the article came out the next day in the campus newspaper, the headline basically said, Physicist finds non-magnetic iron at site of Aurora spaceship crash. There wasn't one word in that article at all about the fact that I needed to talk to the metallurgist to find out what these properties were. And, uh, of course, then the cat was out of the bag, so to speak. As a result, Dr. Gray, his findings, and the piece of the Aurora spaceship became a part of the legend. But this part of the saga was misrepresented. Newspapers sometimes are in the business of reporting what they see as the news. That's not necessarily really what the news is. The real truth of the matter is, those materials were the kind of things you would have expected to find on a farmyard in Aurora, Texas. Having gleaned all the evidence they could from the crash site, investigators now shifted their focus toward the Aurora Cemetery. People said there was a body that was blown out of the craft and it was badly mangled. And the story was they gave it a Christian burial in the local cemetery. We were trying to determine what was the oldest part of the cemetery. That was our logical place to start looking first. They wandered around looking, and one of the local people said, uh, those people aren't looking in the right place. You've got to look for this 100-year-old gnarled oak tree. It's got a big beehive in it. So our investigators went there, and they found this small stone that looked like it had an etching of some kind of, a, of an airship. Believing that they had finally found the spaceman's grave, investigators for the Mutual UFO Network, or MUFON, made another startling discovery. And when they went to the grave site where this piece of stone was, 
they got the same decibel reading on their metal detector that they did from where they picked the material up from the ground. Walter Andres, former international director of MUFON, believes there is a connection between the samples located at the crash site and what was reading inside the grave. The fact that they detected metal down in this grave indicated that someone must have buried, along with the body, uh, some of the metal fragments from the crash site, which gives it more importance because it ties the two together. To find out if there was something there, we sent a certified letter to each of the members of the Cemetery Association in Aurora and asked permission to exhume the body. But uh, it was fairly impossible to do that because uh, the Cemetery Association was dead set against it and they were getting an injunction to stop it. And in fact, the, the day that everybody wanted to descend on the cemetery, they asked the sheriff of Wise County to put some deputies out there, and he did. He said, we don't want people coming into the cemetery and digging all over because we're very proud of what we have here, and we don't want to see a lot of excavation going on looking for a body. Well, it's frustrating because if we could found that, this would be one of the bigger events, and we really would top off this whole investigation by coming up with an alien body. After two weeks, the patrols ended, and MUFON investigators suffered a crushing blow to their research effort. When we were able to get back to the grave site, uh, the marker was gone. We don't know who took it or how. Then, another blow. Uh, someone had driven a three-inch pipe down into the earth there and apparently pulled the metal up in this three-inch pipe. One of our MUFON investigators checked it and did not find any trace of metal with his metal detector. What could have been evidence to authenticate the Aurora UFO mystery was gone. Coming up, skeptics fight back. Other explanations to the Aurora legend are far from being out of this world. In Texas, we have an old saying that never let the truth stand in the way of a good story. Was this really Texas's Roswell? That's what investigators in 1973 hoped to find out. But like the Roswell story in 1947, the Aurora, Texas legend grew larger and the story more twisted as each day passed. At every turn, skeptics challenged journalists and investigative agencies like the Mutual UFO Network and the International UFO Bureau seeking to disprove their research. The theories ranged from balloons soaring through the sky to the belief the Aurora legend was merely concocted to save a dying town. The most prevalent theory to explain the 1897 airship mystery is that it was a balloon. Well, unfortunately, there is physically no way it could have been a balloon. There are no balloons that can rise or fall with lightning speed. They cannot turn at right angles. They cannot go vertically up and vertically down. Uh, they simply can't do it. I don't think the balloon theory is feasible in this because of the detailed descriptions of the different airships that were available at the time. The government, even in the 40s, tried to claim that different pilots were chasing balloons. Even the famous Roswell crash was a high-altitude balloon that had actually crashed. So the balloon theory has been there a long time. <laughs> With these facts, many dismissed the balloon theory. Other skeptics, however, theorize that the Aurora legend is simply a made-up story invented by the author of the original Dallas Morning News article from April 19, 1897. In my opinion, uh, the Aurora story was one that was concocted by S.E. Hayden. I did find some people that, uh, that seemed to recall that their, their ancestors had said that Hayden was a, was a great practical joker. 
Um, and what a wonderful practical joke this was in, in 1897, except that it wasn't recognized at that. I've heard the allegation that the author of this uh, article, Mr. Hayden, was some was a prankster and a hoaxer. Um, I've seen no hard evidence of that, and I've seen no other articles that he wrote that turned out to be wrong. Although Cheriton is challenged by some experts, he offers a convincing argument to back up his claim. If Hayden was acting as a reporter as opposed to a hoaxer, it seems very strange to me that he didn't follow the story up to say, well, people showed up for the burial of the alien, and we put a little grave marker over it, and somebody said a prayer. It was a wonderful ceremony. That, to me, would have been expected, but yet it didn't happen. The mayor of Aurora, Texas, Barbara Brammer, has spent many years researching the town's history and believes her input may solve the Aurora legend. The legend, from what I have been able to read, started after several disasters that we had in the city. The first of those disasters was a brutal boll weevil infestation, which destroyed Aurora's primary cash crop, cotton. Shortly thereafter, there was a fire on the west side of the town that destroyed several buildings and several people lost their lives. And the deaths did not stop there. Shortly after the fire, a massive outbreak of spotted fever nearly wiped out the remaining population of Aurora. It was in uh, 1896. Everybody tried to leave it could. The whole city at one time was under quarantine, and the only time they left their houses was whenever they went to the cemetery to bury someone. In the early 1890s, Aurora saw a glimmer of hope. The railroad was set to lay track in the town and provide much needed economic relief for the townsfolk. They got as far as laying a spur in this direction for the railroad. And then another railroad was going to be coming from out west and it got within 27 miles of this before it was stopped. And uh, it became known then as the railroad that never was. The town was crippled economically, and the resident spirits were crushed. It is this string of events that some believe might provide the motive for the Aurora legend. Aurora definitely needed the uh, railroad to save everything that it had going for it at that time. When it didn't come through, it started downhill. People started moving away. I believe the people who were left in this town needed something to look forward to, and uh, this could be the reason that someone made up the story. The debunkers said Judge Proctor did not have a windmill, okay, so therefore the whole story is bogus. According to Charlie Stevens, no, he did not technically have a windmill, but he had a wooden derrick windlass, which is a wooden tower used to haul up the sump on his well. So that's a matter of semantics. There was a wooden tower there that the thing could have crashed into. In order to find evidence, I found one of the metal angle brackets that supported the wood arm of the windlass. One metal bracket is still there at the scene. Another element of the legend has come under attack from skeptics. The initial identity of the spaceman came from T.J. Weems, a local member of the U.S. Army Signal Corps. It is argued that Weems was only the town blacksmith, and in no way an expert on astronomy, like the newspaper claimed. According to Charlie Stevens, T.J. Weems was also an uh, amateur astronomer, had his own telescope, and was widely known as a lay expert on astronomy, so that uh, argument that he, he didn't have any knowledge, is uh, that's pretty specious too. Despite the many explanations that researchers, journalists, and skeptics have for the Aurora legend, there is at least one thing that everyone can agree on. As far as I'm concerned, it's still a good story. It's a good story. I wasn't around then. But my granddad could tell a pretty good story. In Texas, we have an old saying that never let the truth stand in the way of a good story. After three decades, Hayden Hughes returns to Aurora, but can he solve the riddle of the mysterious airship once and for all?
we have maybe one of the most scientific finds of the 20th century right here behind us. It has been more than 100 years since the quiet of Aurora, Texas was allegedly shattered by the crash of a mysterious airship. Like the incident in Roswell, New Mexico, that supposedly took place in 1947, the truth may never be known. But to some ufologists, this case from 1897 may be the key to solving the whole UFO phenomena once and for all. The significance of the Aurora encounter was that there was a body left to be studied and that there were hundreds of sightings of the same description over the central United States during that time. We see what happened at Roswell, we see what happened at some other sightings, but this one held the answer and because it was before modern day censorship, that's a key. It's still there. No one went in to cover it up. While this former boomtown used to boast 3,000 inhabitants, there are only about 400 people living there today. The town may have decreased in size, but the controversy surrounding its most famous visitor has only grown. If nothing else, the tale of the mysterious airship crash has served to polarize Aurora, dividing believers from skeptics. Aurora's big claim to fame has to be the legend. It's the thing that has lasted longer than anything else. Some people think it's a funny joke going around. They do not believe that this actually happened, and uh, they'll laugh at you because they say it's such a hoax. Well, we're dealing with belief systems here. And uh, I found this when I first began to investigate this in the little town of Aurora. About half the people said, no, it was just a big hoax. And the other half said, no, it, it really happened. I had a feeling that they thought people were laughing at the little town of Aurora, even though the population there now had absolutely nothing to do with the airship mystery. I just always got the sense that, that this is not something they wanted to embrace. Despite the town's ambivalence towards its famous legend, in 1976 they installed a plaque at the cemetery that supposedly houses the alien's remains. Since the actual stone marker was stolen more than 30 years ago, it is impossible to know the precise location of the pilot's body. To me, the only thing at this point that would satisfy it, it's pretty obvious we're not going to find a grave site to dig in. So secondary let's go to the well although the windmill above the well no longer exists the former proctor property was purchased by brawley oats in 1945 long-standing rumors hold that the well on the property was contaminated by radioactive debris more than 100 years later the legend has also grown to include a mysterious patch of ground that lacks vegetation when the mayor shared details of this rumor with Hayden Hughes in 2005, it renewed his interest in solving the mystery. Roar, to me, had the most possibility of providing evidence that could confirm or deny the existence of the airships and the occupant. And when we left empty-handed, I saw it kind of as a failure because the evidence was still there. Maybe two feet under where we were standing, but still, we were unable to walk away with something we could really go forth and say, all right, here's something. Let's investigate that further. For the first time in over a quarter of a century, Hayden decided to revisit the place where it all began, the crash site. This is the alleged crash site of the airship. We're on top of the hill, valley all the way around. This is where Proctor had his property, his windmill was here, and we had a well, which was later submitted in. Certain areas are still accessible, but this fence stands in front of Judge Proctor's original well. Several requests to gain access to that part of the property were made for this program, but no calls were returned. My gut feeling tells me we're onto it and there's something there, and I can't dispel that. 
so close to where he feels the answers to the airship mystery lie, Hayden Hughes's frustration is palpable. We have maybe one of the most scientific finds of the 20th century right here behind us, and we can't get to it because of this big birdcage that's been built over and cemented in, sealing below the evidence that may have contaminated the soil around it that is keeping vegetation from growing today. And if it could be possible to go down, dig up, whatever, that might be what it takes to put an end to this legend over all these years. If we could find out what is in that well, we would know if there's any radiation uh, occurring there or even parts of the crash site. When the craft blew up and exploded, there could be pieces down in that well. Most people search for just what's on the surface and don't take the time to really dig down and find out. You know, it's interesting to note that we're back here where it all started. Right here on this very site. Time has come and gone. A lot of stories has come and gone. Until we can get on the other side, until we can get some good soil samples or get down in the well, this is where the story's going to stay, just rolling along and continuing to grow. If the entire legend of the airship crash of 1897 is a hoax, then an amazing practical joke has been played on everyone by S.E. Hayden the man who wrote the original newspaper article for the Dallas Morning News. But without concrete evidence, ufologists can neither debunk the hoax nor prove the legend to be true. There are lots of legends and stories going around that are passed from word of mouth and through newspaper clippings and so on. But we deal with the facts. We investigate UFOs and we try to prove beyond a question of a doubt uh, when we investigate a case that it was a UFO. I would say that the probability of the crash actually happened